here with divorce661.com. We're here back again with Patty Handy, financial coach. Um, talking about today, we we're talking about the emotional side of divorce. We're going to talk, uh, cover several topics. We're going to talk about the emotional impact. We're going to talk about uh, therapy and counseling and how that may play a role. We're talking about common emotions and a whole bunch more. How are you doing today, Patty? I'm doing great, Tim. How about yourself? Good. Doing good. Looking forward to getting into this. Again, more content that for both of us, more things we're talking about that will help my clients and yours, which I love. Yes, I do too. Awesome. So the emotional side of divorce. So I wrote down a couple of questions. Some may overlap. We kind of went over these a little bit, but I want to just knock these out one by one. And I'm really interested in getting your feedback and your thoughts on these questions as it relates to what you do as a financial coach. So number one, can you describe the emotional impact that divorce can have on individuals, particularly when it comes to ending a long-term relationship? Yeah, well, having gone through a divorce myself, I can speak to that personally. Um, you know, it goes without saying that it is a just a combination of emotions. There's a lot of, um, you know, can be anger. It could just be sadness. It could be grief. Obviously, your 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 loss. If there's children involved, you're dealing with what it's doing to the kids and how it's going to impact their lives. Um, you're dealing with uh, just fear of how do you start over? How do you, you know, what do you do first? Um, who do you trust? You know, where do you even begin? Um, it's just a combination of, of stuff, but it's really, you know, first and foremost, it's grief. And even if you're the one who decided to, uh, or you, you were the one who initiated the divorce, there's still grief involved. There's still loss. You've, you've lost this time with your spouse, um, who was most likely your best friend. Um, and now it's just gone. It's just, it's just, it's just, it's over. And, um, you know, that's, that takes some time. So be, be uh, gentle with yourself because it's, it's a, you know, it's a rough road and it's not a linear healing process. It's not something that's a straight line. You will feel better. It'll be two steps forward, one step back, three steps forward, four steps back. I mean, it's just this duration for a while. So, um, just, Take it one small step at a time, for sure. Yeah, I suppose, you know, long-term relationship can mean, I suppose, many different things to different people. California courts consider a long-term marriage anything over 10 years. You know, maybe someone in a perhaps a bad relationship could think one-year marriage is a long-duration uh, divorce, I suppose. Uh, but in a traditional, say, long-term relationship divorce, maybe 10, 15, 20 years, I suppose this question is, is coming up, the emotional impact because of the amount of time spent in that relationship, wouldn't you say? Yes, for sure. I, I was married over 10 years, and so I consider that a long-term marriage. And yeah, you just have this... Um, this life with this individual that you were so acclimated to and so accustomed to waking up to every day with and, and, you know, again, best friends and traveling and memories and experiences and all of that, it just, it's, you know, overnight, um, it doesn't disappear overnight, but with the divorce, it, 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 it does. And so it's um, overwhelming. It's, it's I mean, like I said earlier, there's just so much fear and there's so much trying to figure it out. Like what happened? Why did that happen? Why, you know, could I have done something different? Can he have done something different? What, what, you know, all those questions that come up. Um, and so, yeah, it is definitely a, uh, it's definitely a journey. And so if you are going through something like this and you are, um, you know, long-term, you know, again, just, Give yourself grace. I was thinking of something when you were talking about that. It made me think that like with our clients, there's a lot and all of our clients are are mostly amicable, cooperative and all that. But usually, I don't know, maybe 50 percent of the time it's mutual. They talked about it. And maybe the other half of the time is one spouse has had more time to give it thought like they were the one that approached their spouse. So. What I found in those cases is the spouse that may be initiating the divorce process is complete, completely without emotion for the most part, because I think that, you know, people just don't flip a switch one day and decide to file for divorce so that they're unhappy or whatever is going on in their marriage, but that they've probably had these feelings for months, even years before approaching their spouse, who 
And and many times, and this is kind of part B of the of the question. And the question is like what you are seeing and experiencing in your your counseling and your, and and all that you're doing, is that the spouse, and usually it's the husband, um, that is literally shocked that there was anything wrong with the relationship at all. So I know I kind of rambled on there, but the first part is what's your experience or thoughts of one spouse having that time to digest it before, you know, so they're okay with everything for the most part from a emotional side effect and part B being, have, have you experienced or maybe just friends or relatives or people you've worked with that like literally one spouse um, is shocked and how can you have one that's just completely unhappy and one thinks everything is happy go lucky. Yeah, I think that um, the person, like you had said, who initiated it, it was something on their heart and their mind for a, some time. It could be months, could be years. And so the, the, the feeling of being blindsided or shocked isn't there. So they've had the chance to process. They've had the chance to sort of dissect the emotions and they aren't going to be as distraught as the one who is the receiving side of that. Um, however, I do feel, and I see this just with, you know, friends that I've, you know, known over the years who've gone through divorce. Um, it, it, it's still, it's still hard. It's still sad. You still have this loss that you're experiencing. Um, but in hindsight, the individual who was the recipient, so to speak, um, if they looked back and I'll, I'll speak for myself here, I'll, I'll share my personal journey. Um, my ex-husband is the one that came to me. And although I was somewhat blindsided, looking back, um, there were signs and I wasn't happy. Uh, there, you know, there were some, certainly some challenges in, in our relationship. Um, we had just had our son a year and a half prior. So I thought we were just, you know, sleep deprived and, and just raising a baby and there was challenges there. But um, so although I was blindsided, I felt like, you know, there were signs. And now that I'm out on the other side of it, I, I should have seen those. And I think in my mind, I buried them um, out of fear of, you know, being alone, fear of being divorced, all those common things that we have as, as human beings. Right. Um, so I think that even if you are the one that, again, is a recipient, um, there's there's some indication. Your, your intuition probably has given you signals or has spoken to you in some some way um, that felt like things were just not right. It isn't like this marriage is beautiful for one person and the other person is like, oh, this marriage is horrible. Um, the, the issues are the same under the same household. It's just that one is recognizing them more. Um, and that's what I've seen actually it just, you know, again, what I've experienced myself and then with with some friends that I've I've experienced with. Perfect. That, and that segues us perfectly into the next question, which is how can individuals best prepare themselves emotionally for the divorce process and what strategies can they use to cope with the various emotions they may experience? And if I could add on to that, we're, you're just talking about that you saw the signs when you look back on it. Are there, how can people before divorce, how can they see that these things are happening and what should they do if they spot them? Well, every situation is going to be unique, um, and it, it really depends on the reason for the unhappiness in the divorce or in the marriage. Um, so if there is um, infidelity, if there is a person who uh, just, they just grew apart, if there, I mean, there's so many reasons why people to choose to divorce. Sure. Um, but if there is, I mean, if, if you are aware of these things early on, of course, um, communication is huge. Having that conversation, although it's uncomfortable, um, it's counseling therapy, um, we actually tried therapy. It didn't, it didn't work <laughs> obviously, but, um, yeah, I mean, and talking to friends, if, if, you know, if you go to a church and you have a trusted um, advisor at, at church, you know, reach out to them, um, especially if there's kids involved and it's going to really, you know, rattle the family, then, you know, you, you try your best to make it work. You try your best to, to resolve this. And, you know, the grass isn't always greener on the other side. And I've also witnessed that with, with friends where there's a divorce and then they realize, oops, that's, it isn't always great on the other side. Um, yeah. and they, and they realize they made a mistake 
Um, so yeah, just be very mindful, just be very reflective and make sure that this decision is, is the right one for you and the family. So seeking help, maybe talking to others that have been through it, uh, counseling, church, therapy, perhaps all, all options for dealing with the, uh, coping with the emotions they may have, you know, with, with our clients, m- most of the time they've already spoken to each other and sometimes they have not on, on rare occasions. And I'll always tell them that you should, and I won't even let them retain me until they've had one conversation at least to kind of break the ice that they're going to file for divorce. And so they can at least have an opportunity to talk through that. And going back to the first question, have that opportunity to um, give them a heads up. So there isn't that shock and awe because in, in my business and trying to, not that we do mediation, but to keep it as amicable as possible. I always tell folks the, the, the way the process starts is going to have a lot to do with the way the process ends. Meaning mm. if you hire me and we want to just, you know, see what happens and we file for divorce and the spouse gets served and, and it's a complete shock to them, the, 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 the uh, knee jerk reaction is going to be to fight. And it's just a normal reaction because of all the emotions that, you know, the fear and what's going to happen, how your life is going to change. So I won't let them retain us if they haven't had that conversation. And then only after they came back to me to say um, how, how it went. Okay. I want a little feedback. I want to get a good gut check to see if I'll still be a good resource for them because if it goes totally sideways in the conversation and they're not happy, they're not going to get be engaged in the process. Um, they're not going to want to be involved and they will probably end up being a case that, you know, eventually may need attorneys. So I'm very cautious in, the type of clients we kind of let in the door to make sure that they're as close to 100% cooperative and amicable before we even initiate, um, because it's for their benefit as well. If we can get them through this without attorneys and without going to court, it's going to be all uh, the better for them. So, because that shock and awe is is exactly what we are avoiding, you know, in this process. Yeah, and you bring up a good point. It's uh, you know for 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 the person who was the recipient who 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 wasn't aware of this. If they didn't have the conversation, then one person feels very out of control. They feel like they've been blindsided, and they there's anger, and that anger just propels into an ugliness. And if you can have that conversation, like you said, and talk through things, and just agree that um, you know this is not going to be in our best interest moving forward to, you know, stay married and here's why, or, you know, are we willing to go to therapy? Are we willing to work on this? Where, you know, what's wrong here? What, where's, where's the disconnect? Um, and I've had, actually have had seen some situations where after some deep conversations, the, the um, couples did stay married and went on to have a lovely relationship. So um I've even heard of some, I haven't experienced it from my family or friends, but where they divorce and then they get remarried later. <laughs> it's like to, to, to each other. And it's, and it's like, wow, okay, that could have really <laughs> been avoided. But um, yeah, communication is so, so important. And it, it, that just gives both people control of, of um, uh, just being heard, being seen, being understood. That's such an important part of it. Yeah. I got one better for you. I've done, I've done divorce case for spouses uh, and they, then they did get remarried and then I did their second divorce. So, Oh, seriously. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So oh dear. it happens. Don't, I always tell people whenever, you know, we probably have five, six, seven consultations a day and, and, and people have different things going on in their lives and they'll, they'll say, you know, Oh, this may sound weird, but we've been separated for 20 years. We just never did the paperwork. And I'll say, Nope, you're not weird. I had someone separated 45 years. They just didn't do the paperwork. So, or, hey, no. we're still living together. I know it sounds weird, but we've been in different bedrooms for, you know, five years and it's just, it's working, you know. And so I always tell folks, I've heard it all, you know, and because people here contested divorce and attorneys and everyone fighting. So when it comes to being able to do this amicably and be responsible and making decisions for yourself and your children and your best and their best interest, it's a whole different ball game in the divorce process going that route um, and doing so. And there's one other thing I wanted to address that I, I, I went into the, uh, you threw me off with the uh, getting remarried again. I wanted to make sure I brought that up, but maybe it'll come back to me as far as what I, I wanted to uh, say. Oh, I know what it was. Some of our most challenging divorce cases are from one of the spouses absolutely not wanting to be divorced. They mm-hmm. are, or, I don't say worse as in bad, but a divorce case to get through court requires either a, 
an, you know, an amicable arrangement and agreement or to go to court at trial. And if one party is just not engaging in the process at all because their intent is to buy time to make it not happen, um, those are the most challenging cases. And it, it happens just once in a while, even, even though I do as good as I can on consultations to make sure everyone's on the same page. Once in a while, they'll call on, on outside of our you know group conversation and say, Tim, I, I don't want this divorce and I'm going to do everything I can to prevent it from happening. And so those those can be very challenging. You know, I'll usually tell the other party, hey, you probably gonna need an attorney because you're gonna have to pull them through the court system, kicking mm. and screaming. And just it can mm. be a long process going through court and attorneys as it is, but when one party's not engaging at all, it's 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 entirely another ballpark. Yeah, another, that's you know, another that's process. tragic. Yeah, that's yeah. very sad and and certainly hard for the if there's kids involved for the kids to witness all that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. You had mentioned uh, in your last uh, discussion we were talking about about counseling and then kind of going back to or therapy and then talking about, um, you know, giving the the spouses an opportunity to um, understand that, hey, I'm filing for divorce and so forth. How how can people do that? Like if my wife said to me today, I want a divorce and I didn't want it. And I said, well, let's seek counseling. Where would we start? in that journey is, I mean, aside from a Google search, or, I mean, you probably have references, I would imagine to therapists or I, I, I'm making that up. I haven't asked you that before, but how, where would someone start if they were going to attempt uh, therapy or counseling? Yeah. yeah, that's a good, a good question. So I would definitely, um, yes, I do have referral sources for that. Um, and I would, I would ask friends and family for names because um, you want somebody that understands the dynamics of divorce and, and that piece of it and um, that they've worked with themselves. So uh, ask for referrals from, from individuals that you, you know, trust and, and get those names um, and then perhaps have a, you know, a quick phone conversation with them and just interview them over the phone, so to speak, to see if it's a, if it's a good fit. Um, I always encourage um, the individuals to get therapy on their own. And then also the group or the, or the couple. Uh, so doing both. To, yes, for, for sure. Um, it's it's important to have the individual because so many of the convers you know so much of the conversation may not come out in a in a in a couple's setting where they feel comfortable just unloading you know when they're when they're safe by themselves with the with the um, with the therapist. So definitely do both, and I can attest to therapy being a great resource. Um, I had therapy, uh, you know, during my divorce and, and post-divorce, and it was instrumental in me healing and just, um, it gave me tools that I needed to help me to get past some hurdles. Um, and I, I'll give you this one story that my therapist uh, had told me, and it was just, I don't know why the analogy worked, but it did. And hopefully this analogy will help somebody who's listening. I remember going into her and saying, when am I going to stop feeling so horrible? When am I going to stop crying? I can't continue like this. I just, I can't. And it was early on in the divorce and it was just, you know, the emotional distraught. And she said, if you were to be in a car accident and you got your leg completely crushed, every bone was crushed, every muscle was ripped, every tendon was ripped, you, you were just completely annihilated that leg. And you just kept saying, hurry up and heal, hurry up and heal, just heal. Um, it doesn't work that way. You have to let nature take its course. You've got to make sure that you take care of the leg by way of making sure it's cleaned and you see a doctor and you get the proper cast and you get the surgery if needed and you get the proper care and then you rest and you take care of it and you take care of your, 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 your leg so that it will heal completely and correctly versus if you were just to start running on it and thinking it's going to just work, it's just going to work, I'm just going to ignore it. Uh, then it will never heal correctly and it won't it won't really come back to 100%. And it's the same thing with the, um, that's the analogy that she used for me. She goes, you've got to just let nature take its course. You got to take care of yourself. You've got to heal yourself, get the help you need. Um, and that help is, includes therapy and includes, you know, exercise and eating well and spending time with friends and finding things that you can do to, you know, that bring you joy and that's fun for you. And whatever it is that you, you know, do in life that makes you feel better um, you do those things to, again, self-care, and then it's in time, in time, that will help you to progress. And then one day you'll just go, gosh, I just feel so much better today than I did last week and a, a month ago or six months ago. So it will happen, and I can attest to it will happen for sure. Um, 
but it's 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 not fun going through it. But that was a great analogy, and I would never have thought of that <laughs> going sure. into it. No, but it was good. She she was uh, she was helpful, and of course there were other things that she had said, obviously. But um, that was one that stuck with me that I always share. Sure, you know it. So it sounds like the advice is to, you know, if if that's your tent, whether it's counseling or therapy, to see if you can maintain the marriage or not, or therapy. You the the recommendation was in both the group setting and individually, which made me think just because you through therapy decided, well, we are going to, we are going to go through divorce. doesn't mean you can't, that you have to stop that individual therapy that might even, well, would obviously be beneficial if needed during the process. And even after, depending on how long that those, the, the, those emotional um, issues are lasting. Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And, and I use the same therapist that we use as a couple. I went to her afterwards and I used her obviously for just, just for me. Um, but yeah, I mean, I saw her for months afterwards. Um, and even, I mean, therapy in general, I mean, I've gone to a therapist, um, you know, years after the divorce that weren't divorce related, it was just life stuff. So yeah. therapy is a beautiful thing and there's a stigma around, you know, therapy and we got to just get rid of that. Um, especially around yeah, good men luck and, with that. And therapy. Yeah, yeah. I just, I mean, it is such a gift and, um, why struggle, if you don't have to, and you have the help, I mean, when you're not feeling well, you don't you go to the doctor, right? It's not any different. You just, you get a little help, you get on the right track. Um, and then you, you, you know, go on your merry way. Um, I mean, that's simplifying the, the whole comment, but, sure. um, yeah, I mean, therapy is, is, is a gift and you should take advantage of it, you know, whether it's divorce or otherwise, for sure. Yeah, I, I wrote down a note because I didn't want to forget. I put, it takes two to go through therapy if that's the goal, because, if one party has resistance to it or doesn't want to go to therapy, I mean, that's really going to boil it down to not being possible. I've had people call me and say, yeah, we've tried therapy, but I never was interested in resolving the marriage. So they were never there with the intent to get the help to keep the marriage. It was, they were just going reluctantly. So it really had no, um, chance of ever having any benefit to them. Yeah, that's unfortunate because they didn't go in with an open mind uh, right. or an open heart to to at least attempt to figure out what's going on. Um, but it's still beneficial for the other spouse to get the therapy on their own because they're in control of their healing. Um, they, they can't give the power of their health and happiness to the spouse who doesn't want to participate in the, in yeah. the, in the process. Um, they have control over, you know, taking care of themselves. So yeah. I definitely encourage you to still go on your own. We get quite a few referrals enough to mention it from clients who were referred to us from various therapists. And I should be better about asking who they are and, you know, reaching out and thanking them and all that. And, the, the, the conversation that came up was, I would say, okay, how did that develop? So you're going through therapy with your spouse, trying to work on the marriage. And what was shocking to me is that in some of these cases, again, enough to mention uh, where they're seeking therapy, that at one point in the therapy session, the therapist simply said, yeah, I don't think this is going to work. I think you should get divorced. I was surprised that therapists would take a position like that, much like mediators in a divorce won't take a position even if requested because then they know the second they do that one party is going to feel slighted or they're siding with the other spouse so they're usually just saying let's continue the conversation and and hopefully you'll figure it out but is that shocking to you or does that seem like a, a common way therapists may just step in and say you know i don't think this is going to work yeah, it's shocking to me. Um, I am not a therapist, and I so I can't speak to that. Um, I should ask some of my therapist friends and see what you know what, what they say to that. And I'd love comment. to get them on this uh, show, Patty, with both of us kind of moderating, just to I think that would make for a good episode. Yeah, absolutely, I uh, think that I, I, I agree. Um, but yeah, to make that to, to make that call, um, that that's interesting. There there has to have been something in those conversations that led that therapist to say that, um, knowing that there was no way to reconcile and there was no way that this was going to work. And they were just, she was just trying to 
maybe or she, he or he or she, where it was just trying to, um, you know, move things along for the two of them. Yeah, I'd be interested um, too to see what what was so polarly different that they were just said, you know what, yeah, two hundred hours of therapy and we're still not going to get there. Yeah, yeah. That, like I said, it, it's got to have. There must be something behind that for them yeah. to have made that comment for sure. Yeah. Very good. So I wanted to take a look at our next questions here, and this and this is a big one. So we kind of talked about this a little bit in you know communicating to your spouse as far as. Um, like if you want the divorce, but this question is how can individuals who are going through a divorce communicate effectively with their partner to manage their emotions and minimize conflict? Um, in my mind, and I'd li like to get your response is to try, I tell our clients, try and treat it as a business decision versus a, and, and try and kick out emotion as much as possible. What are your thoughts? Yeah, in a perfect world, that's the case. But when there's so much emotion that's driving the decision, it's that is that's a that's a big ask. Um, I think that yes, if if they can look at that just as here's the facts, and here's what we should do moving forward. Um, but if they can somehow come together with okay, we've got and I'll use the example of having kids. You know, we've we've got these two kids. And we love them dearly. We want to make sure that they are okay through this. How can we best do that? How can we work together to make sure that everything is okay for them? Let's keep ourselves out of this. Let's keep our anger out of this, our sadness, um, and do this for the kids. What can we do? And that way you're working together on, on, a, on, a, on a common love for your kids and not, um, well, you did this and I did this and it's not pointing fingers and it's, it's keeping that emotion and that anger out. Um, and if possible, this is a, another big ask, but if possible, take the time to reflect on, um, you know, one point in time, you loved this person. At one point in time, you were crazy in love, and there were features and, and things you admired about them. And, you know, if you can, if you can say, look, this is really rough. I know we're going through a tough time. Um, I, I, I loved you and we had some great times and, 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 and reflect on the good of the relationship and the good times that you had and try to diffuse some of the anger. And again, that's a big ask. I know that sometimes that just can't happen, but if, if at all possible, if, if that can happen, I would definitely say, um, reflect on the time that things were good and try to bring that to the front of the conversation mm -hmm. just so that it doesn't become so, so ugly and angry. Yeah. Because the alternative is, and I've seen this not with my current profession, but when I worked for a law firm and worked for the courts, people that the anger and emotion dictate their decisions. And generally that results mm -hmm. in nothing but bad decisions that yep. will ultimately just end up costing them money. And yep. in many cases, if they had been able to put their emotions in check, they would have ended up with a better result um, in their decision-making, say for instance, with their kids and, and, and definitely financially in the form of attorney's fees and going to court, if they could have kept that in check and made these decisions on their own, because again, working for both the courts and a law firm for a time, it was the emotion that pushed them into saying, I want full custody of my kids when there was nothing in the world that would ever suggest that was going to happen. Because there, you know, there wasn't domestic violence, there wasn't, you know, criminal record, or you know, all these other things where that might happen. But they still are going to fight for it for whatever reason, and usually to punish the mm -hmm. other spouse. Yeah, yeah, I, I I have witnessed that unfortunately, and I've witnessed um, using the kids as pawns yeah. in in a situation like that, and that just breaks my heart because at the end of the day, you're just you're devastating your kids and the relationship over the long run with your kids is going to be damaged. Um, but yes, some, you know, that's, that's the, if we can figure out a way, Tim, to, to um, diffuse the anger and diffuse the emotion um, in those heated moments and in that, in that time of utter pain, um, I mean, that would be just a, a godsend. That, that, that would be just such a game changer for, yeah for the entire experience for those going through a divorce. Yeah. And 
for a lot but it's not things don't change i was in interviewing um, a few weeks ago and just just to share with with my clients and and the people that watch my information to show them the differences in doing it amicably and shared some of her experiences with her clients and what's going on when you have attorneys and all of that is still in play. The emotional side of things, forcing them to make decisions. We talked about her uh, talking to her clients about you know trying to make it a rational decision, whereas other attorneys may take advantage of that and say, yeah, this is a good chance for me to, to have some billable hours and that's, you know, and, and maybe not share that it's very unlikely it happens. One thing that was interesting though is sometimes you don't have a choice in to fight back because in the scenario I gave, if one spouse is is doing that to the other and maybe using the children as pawns, like this attorney said, we can't be put on the, our heels and be on the defensive in that whatever claims are being made in court, we have to go on the offense because it, you're forced to do that. So mm -hmm. once someone starts, I mean, if you show weakness, you know, then I guess they're good. They can win in court. They can convince the judge. So you have to go on the, and push back. And we're talking about like trials and, and motions in court and in front of the judge. And, you know, he said, she says and all that. So that's interesting too. Once someone's doing it, it takes both to really settle down and figure things out. Because if one starts, as this attorney said, we can't be put back on our heels and, and, and be on the defensive throughout the process. Yeah, it just spirals. It spirals out of control. That's, that's a good and, analogy. Yeah, spirals. Yep. Yeah. And it's it's tragic, but it happens too often. Yep. Yeah. Well, um, the other question I have, I think we covered, uh, Patty, but we were talking about the emotional side of divorce. And obviously there is and can be a lot of emotional uh, issues in divorce that you'll go through. Even um, our most amicable clients, as you, as you said, there's going to be some amount of it. And I think what we've determined is that as much as you can control that, and like you said, it is a big ask, the more you can, the the better chance you have of going through an amicable divorce. Yeah. And at the end of the day, that's really what you want. If, if divorce is the only way out, then as, uh, as peaceful and friendly as you can make it, the better for all involved, especially for the kids, if there's yep. kids involved, um, financially speaking, uh, just emotionally speaking, you can both get on with your lives and you'll, you know, get on with healing. Um, it just, it just, yeah, if there's a way to cut through that, that's the best way for sure. Completely. Patty, great talking to you. Before we end, can you just uh, let us know how people can get a hold of you and just briefly tell us some contact information, your website and, and all that good stuff? Yeah, thanks, um, Tim. I have, um, if you go to Minding Her Money, uh, M-I-N-D-I-N-G, hermoney.com, there's a free download of a roadmap that you uh should take. I wish I had this roadmap when I was going through my divorce. It's basically the nine components of of your area areas of your life that would be um, important to address. And then there's a short training, and then an opportunity to book a call with me if you want to have a conversation about working with me in the future. Um, but mindinghermoney.com is where you can get that free uh, road roadmap, and you can reach out to me that way as well. Great talking to you as always, Patty. Thank you, Tim. Likewise. All right.